Okay, so now I'm on to part seven of this series. If you haven't seen the other episodes, I would advise you watching them first before watching this one. I've now come to the stage where I'm talking about the things that happened after Aaliyah had died. As 2002 began to come to an end, many fans were anticipating and wondering if any of Aaliyah's unreleased material would ever be heard by the public. As a tribute to her hard work and dedication, and a thank you to her fans, a collection of unreleased material and some of Aaliyah's greatest hits titled I Care For You was released on December 10th, 2002. Okay, so in this fourth album, it was an album that was released after Aaliyah's death. The majority of songs are ones that have been already released, but there's a few new ones. The album features six unreleased songs, as well as some of Aaliyah's biggest and iconic tracks. The lead single for the album, Miss You, was released a month prior it became one of Aaliyah's signature songs. When it comes to the song Miss You, I had no idea that she sung in it. In fact, I'm still not convinced that she does actually sing in it. Originally written and recorded by Genuine in 1999, Aaliyah asked to record the track for her self-titled album. She had planned to include it on the album. However, Blackbound felt that the track would not be successful and therefore it was scrapped. When I first heard this song, it was around January 2014, I believe. It was a few months after I told people that I was Aaliyah, and I was convinced that the only reason why this video was done was because Aaliyah's friends had found out that she wasn't dead, and that they were doing a tribute song as a way of telling me and confirming with me that yes, they believe what I've said, they believe that I'm Aaliyah. And when I was listening to this, I thought that they were doing it just to send me a sort of comfort message that we know what's happening. Dearest, sweet Aaliyah, I have trouble accepting the fact that you're gone, so I won't. It'll be like we went for a while without seeing each other. But I can understand why God would have wanted you close to him. Because you truly were an angel on earth. You do that they know that I'm a goddess and that they're okay with this news. I believe this because there's a lot of things in the lyrics that seem to suggest that Aaliyah's not dead. <laughs> that she's living another life. I know you got another life. You gotta concentrate, baby. Come back to me. Can you hear me calling? Calling for you. For you. Cause it is. The guy in the video is wearing a phoenix jumper. Now you're gone and I'm lost without you here now. But I know I gotta live and make it somehow The story about the phoenix is supposed to be that it's about a bird who dies, turns into ash and then from the ashes a new bird is born and resurrected from that. So it's like dust yourself off and try again which is what I believe has happened between me and Aaliyah. So them adding this to the video seems symbolic as to what has happened between me and it's like they did it because they knew about what had happened to me. You know there's lots of stuff in this song and I'm gonna go through it. It's been too long and I'm I believe that I was Aaliyah in 2013, so that's like 12 years after Aaliyah's death. So yeah, it has been a very long time. What am I gonna do? Said I've been needing you, you. And it's like they said, oh, we want you because we found out that you're alive and we want to talk to you, but for some reason we can't because we've made a covenant to ignore you. So it's like they found out that Aaliyah has died and been reincarnated as someone else. And they were saying how they now wanted to know things about my life and you know who I've been with, what kind of friends I have now, dot dot dot. I believe they added these messages to the song just to let me know who they were. I miss you after college. Yes, you went away straight from high school. You up and left me. We were close friends, also lovers. Did everything for one another. It's almost like they knew that I wouldn't recognize them, that I wouldn't know who they were. So they're just kind of saying that, you know, we went to school together. I've known you from my childhood. I know you don't remember me now because you've got new memory, new life, and you have no memory of Aaliyah's life. But yeah, this is why I believe they added these words to the song, because they knew that I wouldn't have any memory of being Aaliyah when I come back. Come back to me. Can you hear me calling? I believe they added that part because I believed at the time that they knew that Aaliyah wasn't dead, that I was hearing them, that I was listening to them, listening to this song. They knew that I'd find this song. And 
and it felt like they did this to send a message to me that I was alive and that they knew that by me listening to this song I was hearing them call to me. It could also be a message saying how I should try and find them, I should try and track them down. I know Miss Elliot, yes. The problem is you can't contact famous people, why? Because they get thousands of people trying to contact them. And the other people, I don't know who they are, I don't know their names. I don't know how I'd find out who they are. Although I should have listened to this documentary before, because this documentary does actually reveal who most of these people are. The video from Miss You served as a tribute to Aaliyah, featuring many of her industry friends, including DMX, Missy Elliott, Queen Latifah, Little Kim, Static Major, Tony Braxton, Tweet, and many more. I've definitely heard of DMX, Little Kim, and Queen Latifah, but that's weird because I had no idea that they were in this song. I don't really recognise them through their looks. But again, it's famous people, and you can't contact famous people because too many people try and contact them. I could try and contact them now, but I still don't know if they know or if they're capable of believing. I believe that they know, but at the end of the day, I don't actually know if they know. You know, I believe if they knew, they had made a covenant to ignore me, because that would explain why they're not coming to talk to me. Hence, if they have made a covenant to ignore me, me going to try and talk to them isn't going to work, because under the oath, they're not going to agree with anything I say. I've been holding back this secret from you. I probably shouldn't tell it. And if they don't believe me, then convincing them that I'm right will be a very hard thing to do. You can't prove that you're someone when physically you're not that person, when mentally you don't have that person's memory. They believe we're the same person, but that's only through a soul. I can't say, here's what Aaliyah's soul looks like and this is what my soul looks like. Here we're an identical match. You know, there's DNA tests, but there's no such thing as soul tests. And convincing people that we've been reincarnated is a really hard thing to do in a world that's mostly Christian and doesn't believe in reincarnation. So even if I do go to them, I doubt they'll believe me. I do believe that they knew, but I believe that they were ignoring me for a reason. If you tell the world, you know will be weak. Oh boy, see I'm trusting you with my heart, my soul, I probably shouldn't let you I was concentrating on things at the time. I was concentrating on things because I believed that I was inspiring things of the past. And so I believe this is what they were saying. You've got to concentrate on what you're doing, which is inspiring the whole timeline. Subconsciously connecting with people and getting them to be more like me and less like the vile cavemen that they used to be. I was also lying in bed, noticing how a lot of things that I was going through seemed to be literally inspiring the past. And therefore, if it's not my destiny to go to them, I can't go to them because that's not what I'm supposed to do. It's not what my body was allowing me to do because I felt paralyzed to the bed for most of the first year. And by the time the second year came past and they still hadn't tried to contact me, they still hadn't approached me, I kind of completely lost interest in ever wanting to talk to them. They even asked the question, is your heart still mine? And then it sounds like someone says no in the background. I seen all these connections from the beginning and I was convinced that they did this as a way of helping me but months and months went on no one came to speak to me about anything no one was helping me I then started hating this song and hated anyone who would do this song because it was like why have you done this and then just chose to ignore me for years and years and years I know when you look on the YouTube video it says that it was done years ago and there's evidence on Wikipedia and things like this that it was done in 2003 or 2004 but at the time I watched this I also watched a huge number of songs that seemed to be about what I was talking about, what I believed. You know, I believed that I was inspiring songs of the past and it felt like they were backing me up, helping me by creating new songs that were proving my theory, new songs that seemed to be about me. The Return of Eve and the Seven Year Tribulation that she will go through where she's missing her partner, a partner who's staying away from her because of an ancient covenant. Only these new songs that I know had just been released after I told people who I was, they had their dates changed to make it look like it was done years before and well because I saw this at the same time that I saw all those things, when I saw it I thought and believed that this too was another song that was done just recently but had had its dates changed to make it look like it was done years before so that when I am exposed as being the Messiah people can look back and think oh my gosh yeah there's lots of similarities in the song. It does say, I know you've got another life, you've got to concentrate. But because the dates look like it was done from 2004, you know, people would be like, oh my gosh, they really were predicting things. They were predicting something that happened years ago. 
and then knew it would happen in the future. You know, this is what I believed. But now that I've done a lot more research on this song, and I bought a promo CD dating back to 2003. Bought that on eBay a few weeks ago. But yeah, I do now believe that this song was released years and years ago. Hence, the things in the songs are actually prophesying things that will happen to Aaliyah. E.g. she won't be dead, she'll come back. And now I'm sitting here Thinking about you And the days we used to share It's driving me crazy I don't know what to do I'm just wondering if you still care just to recap, I was angry when I first heard this song because I thought they did it in 2013 and then just ignored me for years. But I'm not angry now because I know that they did it before they knew that Aaliyah wasn't dead. Hence, they did it out of love for their friend who just died. Not out of the knowledge that their friend has come back as Christ. Only they now have to ignore her. You know, that's wrong. I guess when they wrote the song or when they were singing the song, they thought they were talking about how she would get another life in heaven. And maybe the other lyrics were only chosen because they were in the song and Aaliyah had partly sung a lot of the song, hence why those lyrics were chosen for the song, because they had already been chosen when Aaliyah was working on it. That might be the case. Thinking about the words, it just doesn't make sense to write these kind of lyrics if it's supposed to be in memory of someone who just died, because it doesn't sound like someone has just died. It sounds like they found out that someone has died, but now still alive. But yeah, I believe that they did that without the knowledge of the second part. How it happened, I don't know. It's definitely God that's inspired that, but anyway. The track will go on to peak at number three on the Billboard Hot 100. Three more singles were released from the album, including I Care For You, Don't Know What To Tell You," and Come Over. In the album I Care For You, the sixth song on the list is I Don't Know What To Tell You. This is the first song on the album that happens to be a new song, unreleased. When I first found out that I was Aaliyah, the first thing I did was to go through all her songs and try and find out hidden clues, hidden messages. You're watching my every move, trying to pick up all some clues. This was one of the first songs I found when searching through her song list. And it was like it's a message to me saying that she, Aaliyah, does not know what to tell me. But she warns me about how people want to handcuff me, how people want to put a wall around me, separate me. Cut me off from all the people who do believe that I'm a Leah. Put me through some sort of sacrifice because that's what Christ is supposed to go through. Incarceration, so being locked away, chained up, feeling like you can't get out in the world. And yeah, this is how I was feeling. I believed that my name was the name of the Lord from the 13th of June 2013. I believe that I was Eve from August the 13th. I believe that I was Aaliyah from the 10th of October. And now a week or two later, I'm trying to find out clues about her. And I come across this song about how she's warning me that I'm going to feel like I'm imprisoned. There's a part in the Bible that says how Jerusalem will be chained away, will be like a captured city. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. <laughs> And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. And it shall come to pass, that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee, and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. This is how I felt, and I felt like this song was a warning for what's going to happen. A warning about what was already happening to me. That people had made a covenant against me to ignore me for a certain period of time, but I just need to wait it out. Shake thyself from the dust, 
Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. I believe that verse is referring to how my people, as in this woman, came down to earth to have a child to help people, but they oppressed her, just like they oppressed women. They rejected the mother. They didn't want to know about God the mother. This is how God was feeling. But the writers of the book picked up on this inspiration, God's thoughts, only they changed many things. So the Christ turned into my people Jerusalem, or my people Babylon, or my people Israel, whatever it is. My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there. They changed the Christ into this nation of people and they couldn't accept the fact that humans were the bad people all humans that are sexist are the ones that have oppressed christ they didn't want to believe that they were the bad people for oppressing this her by turning her into a city they didn't want to believe that so they changed the bad people into like the assyrian and the assyrian oppressed them without cause or maybe there was some truth behind the situation maybe there was some sort of war and the writers wanted to blame it on the other side and hence have created these books out of things that were part truth partly just their thoughts so they came up with these ridiculous books full of crap, crap that claims that they know the word of the Lord. But the truth is, these aren't the words of the Lord. These are just the inspired words of the Lord. So they're writing a book and using inspiration of things that I'm going through, only they're translating it differently because they've got a completely different mind with a bunch of different memories. I don't know history, so I can't say for certain what's a historical fact and what's just fiction. I can't say for certain, but I know you should not work out what the history is through these books alone. You have to do it through archaeology. Studying grounds, battlefields where things were supposed to have happened studying homes, ancient writing. You can't just do it for a collection of books that all seem to contradict each other. You know something's fact if multiple sources come to the same conclusion. Although when it comes to God, you can't say that there's a bunch of books that say this is the word of the Lord, hence this is the word of the Lord, because that's just nonsense. Especially if the word of the Lord is very different in every book. A lot of people want to believe that they can write out the word of the Lord. Just watch YouTube. There's so many people that come claiming to have the word of the Lord. It's all nonsense. And I think in a lot of the books, the writer puts himself in the mindset of Christ, e.g. the mindset of what I'm going through right now, only they believe that it's about them. I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. And they believe that they're the ones that are going through the suffering. Why? Because they're made in my image. So if I'm going through suffering, they're going to go through a similar kind of suffering. Hence why there's lots of passages like this. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I believe my life isn't worth anything because I haven't achieved anything and I'd rather be dead than be a nobody. But I do believe that I have a destiny. I believe that I'm on course to go through a process that inspires the past, that helps to inspire the Bible books. And it's my destiny to bring people to the true knowledge of who God is, myself, and bring people to the truth about how these books were inspired. Not that they are the literal word of God, but rather that people have just been picking up on God's thoughts, my thoughts, only they've been translating it in completely different ways, or mistaking my thoughts for their thoughts. Vice versa, whilst mistaking their thoughts, their opinions for my opinions. Hence, by creating a completely false interpretation of what God is, creating a completely false view of what God can do because those are their thoughts. I'm not denying that they're not going through suffering. A lot of people go through suffering but I do believe that there's prophecies within what they're saying and these things are what I'm going through and they know what I'm going through. Why? Because the timeline is set in stone. The things that I've gone through in the last few years are things that have been destined for me to go through for the whole of the timeline and it's because there's a set timeline. This is how I'm able to time travel. How I was able to die in 2001, go back time, be reborn in 1987 and live out time because the set events of every single second of everything that I do during my childhood these were all things that I was destined to do likewise with everyone in the world you are all destined to do whatever you've done I know it gets a bit complicated because you might find that hard to believe but I believe that God lives outside of time and the computer in the matrix it already knows every second of every minute 
To understand it, you have to imagine you're watching a film or a DVD. No matter how many times you watch that film, the same things are going to happen, whether it be good or bad. The same wars are going to happen, the same words are going to be spoken. I know to get to that stage, filmmakers actually have to write the script, film the scenes, put it together. You know, it takes a lot of work, but this is how The Matrix works. It uses the souls that are within the complex and creates a 3D film based on everyone's souls and minds and what they want to do. So you create your own life, you create your own future, but no matter how many lives lives you have, every single second of every single life is already predetermined by the Matrix. God doesn't control the Matrix. People control their own lives. But God is just like the programmer that helped to program the Matrix. And she jumped into this Matrix so that the programmer can use her soul as a template to shape all other human souls so that all other human souls become like this template. Although to get male and female, masculine and feminine, there are actually two templates, God and her son. If you're finding hard to believe what I say is true, I should also tell you at this point that Elia was actually given the role to play the character Z in Matrix. Before Alia had passed away, she had already signed on to multiple films up until 2008. She had begun filming for the Matrix sequels whilst recording her third studio album. She was set to play the character of Z. Z is a bit like my surname, B. So we changed one letter. Instead of Z-E-E, -E -E, it's B-E-E. -E -E. She's in the third movie of The Matrix, just like I'm at the third stage of my life, third life. Unfortunately, Alia had barely completed filming, as she was scheduled to finish filming later on in the year. Nona Gay was soon recast in the role. And right at the end, you know, this character is supposed to survive. Just like I believe I'm supposed to survive after I've exposed the truth about how the world is in a living matrix. If you don't like the analogy of what I've just given, I could also say that God is a little bit like the guy who first came up with the Big Brother idea. You know, Big Brother is now all over the world, and I'm pretty sure he's not helping participate in every single one of them. Or maybe he is, but only just a little bit. You know, the guy who came up with the concept of Big Brother, he's not actually the one that produces it. He's not the one that really puts the concept together that's down to the producers the editors and the housemates themselves they have to create their own destiny they have to create their own path they have to create their own storyline and their own lines what to say how to react to things and so like the world is like one big big brother house you don't know what's going to happen in the next big brother show but if you look back on past theories you'll know exactly what's happened now imagine if there's someone one level above humans hence they are in the future and they too can look back on every single second of every minute. That is what I believe God is. People on Earth are like the housemates, the leaders of the world, the ones that create companies and make big changes in the world. You know, they're like the producers. And God is just like the heart of the inspiration. Going back to the song now, a lot of people do want to be intimate with God and have a personal relationship with him or her. But when it comes to things, you have to trust God. You have to trust that God is helping. And I also need to trust that things will work out for the best. And when it comes to my research into Alia, I do feel like I'm asking tons and tons of questions. And I sometimes feel like I get the response back too, a response in my head. But I was also getting responses back through these songs. Oh, we play 20 questions every time I walk in or out the door. You know, when I first listened to this song, I kept going over the lines, am I you, am I you? And well, that line just says, get comfortable with what's yours. So it's like, yes, I am you. And try and get comfortable with what's happening because it's going to be a long wait. But I am constantly going through doubts all the time because so many people just aren't capable of believing this. And so many people would make me think that I'm mad for believing what I believe. But this is also mentioned in the song. Yeah, I try to put up with you, these insecurities every day. Although unfortunately, Aaliyah didn't really know what to tell me. Or at least that's the main message of the song. But there are other messages in the song that indicate rage and anger, other things that I'm feeling. So many people wouldn't be capable of believing what I believe. They wouldn't be capable of thinking that things that I'm going through right now are inspiring songs that were written 10, 20 years ago. They would insult me hugely for my belief. And I want justification for what they'd think of me, the true Christ, when many of these people would claim to love the real Christ. When they don't. Justifications for your actions should have been somewhere relaxing. Don't compare me to your last one. I can't help it, she was a fast one. A sassy one, I'm a classic one. 
I would say that me and Leah are both sassy and classy, but it's true that Leah only lasted for 22 years. I'm going to last longer, and I'm not just going to die off like she did. You know, I'm going to stay strong until my belief is firmly out in the world. I'm not a fan on the song All I Need. It is mostly just a love song where someone's expressing deep love towards someone, you know, thinking all I need is you. All I need, I did definitely go through this. I think I'm kind of over this stage, to be honest, because it's been five years and he's barely spoken to me. But throughout the first two, three years, I was just lying on a bed thinking, all I need is him, all I need is him. So I don't want nobody but you Cause I don't love nobody but you and I believe that's how I've inspired these songs through love and feelings. Although I don't agree with the verses on these songs because it's all about someone being happy. Baby, every since I found you, seems like every day I've been happy. And well, I've been miserable since the day I met him. Maybe I'll be happy when he does finally come and talk to me. So the way that you love me, turns me out, baby, I can feel my heartbeat. Seems like baby, I've been thinking, feeling that you are everything. Feels like more and more I'm hoping that you will be all I need. The next song on the album is Don't Worry About Me. I couldn't download this off YouTube for some reason, so I've had to record it myself. So sorry about the quality. I would say the opposite because I've had such a shit life, but I think this is a message for Aaliyah's parents, Leah's family, saying, don't worry about me, you know. It's almost like God in Spirit is giving a subtle hint that, okay, yes, yeah, something bad is going to happen to her, she's going to die, but don't worry about her because she's not actually going to die. You know, she's going to come back, she's going to be okay. I mean, I would say I'm not okay now because my life has been so awful. But okay, I have watched Jerry Springer, and yes, there are worse of families out there, so maybe it's not that bad. I'm not a hungry, starving child in Africa, so I guess there could be worse of situations, so don't worry about me in that sense. The second part of the first verse says something really weird as well, which is to say that it feels like things have changed, it feels like I'm different, but I'm still the same. <laughs> You know, it just feels like the whole of this song is a whole message about how you're not losing me. Nothing's changed. I'm going to go to the spot where people hang. This could be referring to Big Brother or something. And nothing's changed. I'm going to be there. thing I hate about this song though is that it says I'll be home tonight so that is just giving me false hope that something is going to happen that this news is going to be revealed very soon and every day goes past and it isn't revealed so you know it's, it's a horrible message because it gives me hope that something's going to happen soon and it's not it gives me hope that I'm going to be okay that nothing bad was going to happen to me and that hasn't been the case unfortunately I've been hurt a lot by this whole thing and I will never get over it and I will probably take the next thousand years two thousand years to forgive humans for putting this curse on me when it comes to Christ and his forgiveness level you know you can't talk for me you can't say that I have to forgive people. At the end of the day, it's my decision what I do. And no, I do not forgive you. I do not forgive you for what you have put me through. The next song on the album is called Come Over. I'm not really a fan on this song either. Can I come over? Can I come over? Come over, see you. Come over. Can I come over? It's just basically about a girl who loves 
or likes someone and wants to go over and visit them. I remember these days when I first met him, this is pretty much what I was like every single day, just waiting up for him, really wanting him to call back, really wanting to go over. But at the same time, I know me saying this does sound a bit like a clingy girlfriend and I don't really want to be that, but yeah, this song is about a clingy girlfriend. And so I do relate to it. It is how I feel, but I believe that it was because of a spell, not necessarily because I am a clingy girlfriend or a clingy wannabe girlfriend, should I say. Maybe I want to come see you. Said I really want to come see you. Just wanting to hold you, embrace you. I want to look at you and tell you how much I love you. I want you. I need you. Miss you. Come on, come on, the next new song on the list on this album is Erica Kane. I absolutely love this song. I think it's very catchy. I do think it is about me, but I think it's very insulting towards me. Hence why I don't necessarily want to make a music video to it. I could make a music video to it, but if I did, I would just be insulting myself throughout the whole of it. It might work though if I change a few lines to make them not quite as insulting, because I think one or two are wrong. Let me show you an example. She's back on the streets, her fear for the night. She's back on the streets, her fear for the night. So, Aaliyah died, and then she rises again on the third day as Anna B. She's back on the streets, and well, she hates being alive now because her life is going to be a bit cursed. <laughs> You agree if she cuts like a knife. After all the shit that I've gone through in my life, I do have a lot of negative things to say, and I'm pretty sure I can fill you with grief. You know, I do believe that I'm here to destroy Christianity, and that's gonna fill a lot of people with a lot of grief. Good. Make you do things that no others could do. Well, I believe I can do that because I believe that I can get people to want to help me destroy Christianity and very few people would have wanted to do that if they hadn't met me. To turn up a to a fool. Because there's so many people that don't believe in God, that think that time travel is impossible, that don't believe that someone like me, a human, can inspire things of the past, but I can make professors look like fools by saying, actually, you're wrong. God does exist. I can inspire things in the past. Eve is a real person. Reincarnation is the truth. And you're a little bit foolish for not knowing that. Plus, there's so many professors out there that would call themselves Christian and say that they love Jesus and say that they believe that the Bible is fact and stuff. And it's just like, oh my gosh, have you not read how ridiculous the Bible actually is? To think that a loving God had spoken these exact words, it's insane. Oh, I do massage. I have met loads and loads of clients. I've seen them naked. I touch most parts of their body, not their genitals, but all other areas mostly. Those that she met, they're destined to drown. That's true because I've told so many people that I'm Malia. I've told so many people that I'm Eve. I've told so many people that I'm God. And every single one of these people aren't capable of believing me. And they're the ones that are going to drown when they realize that actually I was right. They might look back and think, oh, I shouldn't have insulted her. Or, oh, I shouldn't have thought that she was crazy. I should have listened to what she said. I should have shown a bit more respect when it comes to asking for things. I get a lot of clients asking for all sorts of things. And a lot of these people ask for things even after I've told them that I'm Christ. It's like they completely ignore me and have no respect for anything I say. She'll make a change like you never believe. She'll make a change like you never believe. Because I plan to change the entire world by destroying religion, all of them, and setting up a new religion based on my beliefs. Based on my word, not the words of a 2,000 year old book. She'll turn a working man to thief. Oh, she a lot of people worship Jesus, but I see Jesus, the fictional character, as being like a thief because he steals the limelight from me. I'm the true Christ. He's just a blasphemer that's stolen what is mine and tried to make it his. Okay, that line relates less to me than other lines, but whatever. Still similar. The name Erica doesn't mean anything to me, but it's still quite a nice name. The second verse, again, is more insults towards me. She'll be a friend as long as you spin. 
That's true. I don't actually have any friends. And the main reason why is because why would I go and hang out in a restaurant or in a bar or in a coffee shop with a friend when I could stay at home, potentially get work, meet some new people, make 50 quid, offer a massage and, you know, make money. If I have a friend, it means I have to go out with them. And if I get work during that time, I'm going to have to turn it down. So having friendship actually costs me money. Like I don't see it as I need to take a break. I can't work all the time. I see it as I only get one or two hours of work a day. So I always need to be in the house in case someone calls and makes a booking. I don't actually have friends and I don't want friends because I would rather wait in the house for clients who are willing to pay me for my time. And of course, I make these videos in my spare time and I'm very happy doing that. So, But at the same time, yes, this song is true. I'll only be your friend if you spend money on my time. I don't think that's true of me, but I probably will tear families apart when I destroy Christianity because there might be a lot of people that say strong in Jesus and there might be a lot of people that agree with me that anyone who worships Jesus is actually completely insane. So I might end up breaking a few families. Up. I also support divorce and I would encourage anyone to get a divorce if they're not happy in their current situation. Likewise the same might happen in the Muslim community, you know, I'm really against veils and stuff. I don't want to upset people or put anyone's life in danger. But I think wearing veils is an insult to women because it teaches them they need to suppress themselves and hide from men and see men as being the head and this is just not the truth. But yeah, this also might cause division within the family against people who believe versus people that don't believe me. So this song could be just prophecies about what is going to happen soon. Shoot a poison arrow straight through your heart. I'm not too sure what that's supposed to mean, but I'm sure I will upset a lot of people by what I have to say against Jesus. And there might also be a lot of people that start to love me, only I won't be able to show that affection back. Oh, this is the day for Eric the King. So I think what she means by that is all these things will happen when Anna is exposed as being a liar. There's nothing to lose, none for her to gain. I'm not really going to gain much, I don't believe. Well, I haven't, definitely not in the past. I haven't gained anything. I've just been lying on a bed, depressed and miserable whilst no one believes anything that I say. But at least I've got nothing to lose because I don't actually have that much. Well, I hope that part doesn't happen. If I was to remake this song, I might change one or two lines. As for example, that one. I'm hoping that there's a lot of people that are wanting to put money into my project and help expose the goddess. But at the same time, I would want them to gain something too from it. And yeah, I definitely agree with this part. I believe that part was referring to people that did things about me behind my back. There's a lot of people that believed that I was a goddess, started writing lots of songs, making it seem like they were making prophecies about me, when in reality all they were doing is they've heard something about me and then they were writing songs to try and back it up and changing the dates to make it look like they were making prophecies about me. You know, I'm not going to let these people get away with their lies. I'm going to expose the true dates and, yeah. And there's nothing for you to get. I've completed the album, but I've noticed that there's also some other songs that aren't on either album. I don't know why this song didn't make it to the I Care For You album. That would have made a bit of sense because it hadn't been released before, but I love this song. it's really good. It explains how I feel towards Martin again, like most of the songs. It then talks about an agreement that was made. I believe this is an agreement between Eve and Adam, how they're going to be together. They're okay, they might separate, they might have separate lives, but they will come back, they will get married. When we hooked up, we sat down, we made an agreement, we vowed that, that we'd always be together, do whatever. We said that no one would ever get between us, so that we'll never, ever leave us. That was a while ago. Although I believe that me and him have come back and only now he's kind of keeping away from me, refusing to talk to me. So yeah, I feel like I'm in a bit of a war with him because he won't talk to me. But now lately it feels like, I mean, I feel like going to the spot every single night. Can't make time, can't get a ride. I feel like he's done things about me behind my back 
things that would cause me great grief. I, I just wanna go back, take it way back, all the way back. Can we start again? Do it over. Can we straighten it out? Can we work it out? Cause I don't wanna. I just want to go back and start again. I feel like there have been so many problems and yeah, I would like my memory to be erased so that I don't remember what's happened. So we can straighten things out and work it out. Because at the end of the day, however much I hate him, I also have feelings for him. Although I do think it's a spell and not so much logical feelings. And anyway, the next bit talks about the spell in detail, how I feel like I can't sleep without him or eat without him. Do you realize I can't sleep without you, think without you, eat without you, speak without you, be without you, I can't even breathe without you, I can't feel without you, deal without you, spin without you. My whole world is upside down okay, okay, I'm feeling a bit better now But for years this is exactly how I felt Just such a horrible thing And then to have people do things about me behind my back Believing that I'm okay You know, if these songs are supposed to be predicting things that I will one day go through There's nothing nice or pleasurable about anything that's been said on this song Don't wanna go out cause I can't ride without you Feel like I'm gonna die without you What is a girl supposed to do? This is how I felt, and it was a horrible experience from day one. When I spend my last time to be in your life, I don't want to be without you. It does sum up how I felt. Whatever this arrangement is about Christ returning, you know, it's not working out for me. That is not working out. It's not working out. to be together but it's hurting me and I don't want to talk anymore about it hence I can let this song do the talking the next song I'm going to talk about is are you feeling me this song is pretty explicit you know just listen to the words I agree with them I really want to know if he loves me, I love him back. Is there anyone else that can do it the best? Give the things you need, well it must be me. I've got very big dreams and no fantasies. I do have very big dreams because I believe that I'm God. But I need to know, are you feeling me? Are you feeling me? Cause I'm feeling you. I put my life on this line because I've pretty much given up my life because all I want is him. If these feelings will change when I actually meet him, I don't know, maybe. I do feel like I'm under some sort of spell and there's a possibility that I'll no longer want him when I actually meet him. But anyway, yeah, this song is just a sum up again of how I feel, which I guess most love songs are about love. I'm crazy for you, I'm falling for you, I got feelings for you, are you loving me out? Tell me if it's our time, do I blow your mind? But anyway, the last song I want to talk about is Where Could He Be? I'm pretty sure this is a remake of another song, only it has a completely different melody to it. not a fan of the song but the words are basically about someone trying to find her baby i believe that martin dodd was my son when i was eve and i have traveled all around the world and well i happened to find him down the road from where i lived all my life but anyway because i only found him when i was 26 i guess i went through the whole world looking for him although i guess i didn't actually know that i was looking for him at the time but i felt like in my spirit i was looking for someone who can give my life more meaning The next verse seems to suggest that Aaliyah finds her baby 
and then the baby goes and uses her heart as a rug, which is kind of how I feel, because I believe that I'm inspiring lots of songs, I believe that he knows this, and I believe that's why he's ignoring me, because he's just using me. It's a cry. In early April of 2012, Canadian rapper Drake announced that he'd be releasing a track with unreleased Aaliyah vocals sometime that year. I just found like comfort in all of Aaliyah's music and her, um, her melody choices and the things that she talks about and sort of how she always like, like conveyed these amazing emotions but never got too sappy. You know, she always like kept it G. You know, she taught me like, she taught me that there's a certain way to make music so that it can be appreciated by a lot of people. When it comes to Drake, I really don't know what to say, you know. I believe that his feelings towards Aaliyah were genuine. I do believe that he does like her and is a big fan even. I mean, aside from that, she just made phenomenal music and she was beautiful. But I also think there's an editing of time because he was supposed to have got a tattoo of Aaliyah in 2012. In August of 2012, Drake revealed a beautiful new tattoo of Aaliyah. And was set to release 12 new songs about Aaliyah. In 2012, I found out that I was Aaliyah, October 2013. And so I can't help but think that he got his tattoo, not in 2012, but at the end of 2013. After he heard the news that Aaliyah wasn't dead and that she's actually been reincarnated as someone else. So I believe he made a few posts out with his tattoo and then a year or two later edited the dates of those posts to make it look like it was done in 2012. Hence making it look like he cared about Aaliyah even before he knew that she wasn't actually dead and that she was actually Christ. I say that and mean it but at the same time I do also believe that he does care about Aaliyah and does like her. And I also know there's a really good possibility that I'm wrong about this and that maybe he did generally get it in 2012. And even if he didn't get it in 2012, if he got it in 2013, I really don't care, you know, it's still a nice thing to do. It hasn't hurt me in any way. It does just show his commitment towards her and how he does want to support her. And just weeks later, fans will be blessed with Enough Said, a Nora 40 produced track featuring unheard Aaliyah vocals from an unreleased song originally titled Can You Talk To Me? Featuring a guest verse by Drake, many fans were overwhelmed with joy to hear her voice yet again, as if she had never left the earth. When it comes to the song Enough Said, you know I love it. I really like it. I think that shows that Drake generally does like her. Many agreed that the track was done tastefully, citing the track as having a euphoric undertone. However, some fans were infuriated over the fact that Drake was involved with the track, citing it as disrespectful. So, leave Aaliyah alone. I know you love her, Drake. There's no music video to it, but that's kind of a good thing because if he would have made a music video, I would have believed that he would have made quite a lot of money from it. And for someone to make lots of money out of a song that I was actually singing in, only now I'm lying in a bed gaining nothing out of anything, you know, I think that's kind of wrong. But releasing this song, you know, it's, it's a nice song. It's comforting and stuff. And it's respectful. Can you talk to me? Can you talk to me? I like this song and I agree with what it says, you know, can you talk to me? Tell me what you need me to do to help promote these songs. The problem is, they weren't talking to me. They weren't telling me what they were doing. They weren't involving me in any way. Releasing albums is my dream and I'd love to be involved in this. I heard though that there's 12 other songs that he was about to release. Soon after the release of Enough Said, rumors began to circulate that a new Aaliyah album was in the works to be executively produced by Drake in his camp. The album was to feature 16 new tracks featuring vocals from previous Aaliyah demos. Again, fans of Aaliyah were split down the middle, 
some welcoming the news and other trashing it as unsettling and distasteful. I'm really glad these songs were not released because to release one or two songs and just put them on YouTube, you know, you're probably not going to gain that much money from it. But to release a whole album, you could probably make quite a lot from it if you have the fan base. And even now, Aaliyah does have a fan base. Okay, you can't really make hundreds of thousands of pounds in album sales, but you can definitely make way more money than I was making. You know, back in 2013, 2014, I had pretty much stopped my job because I believed that I was Aaliyah and I believed that they were going to come and help me. So I pretty much was just taking one or two clients a week e.g. making about 500, 600 pounds a year and my rent was about 12,000 a year e.g. I was actually losing money I inherited 20,000 off my granddad so I was living off that and so for them to make a few thousand on it you know that's more money than I was making in the whole year in 2016 I'd given up on them and started working back as a masseuse full time only by this point I'd got kicked out of my tiny studio flat because neighbours were complaining about the number of visitors I had and now had to move somewhere else where I was paying 16,000 pounds a year to live and my current income was about 16, 17,000, e.g. I wasn't making any money other than that week's rent. And so to have to go through all that whilst knowing that there are other people making huge amounts of money off Aaliyah's songs, knowing that they're only doing that because they believe that she's me, whilst I'm literally making nothing and suffering and struggling to try and pay my own bills, you know, that would have just been really wrong and hard for me to cope with. And because I was working as masseuse, I would have to put up with tons of sexual harassment and people wanting more or people calling me up and thinking I'm a prostitute. You know, you have to deal with this if you're a masseuse, so it's not the best of jobs. And plus, the only reason why I'd believe they'd be releasing this album is because they know that she's not dead. And I believe that they found this out through Martin, who is a Sony executive, or knows Sony executives. Not too sure which one it is. But they found out through him that I'm Aaliyah. And this was the reason why they were releasing this album. You know, I told Martin that he was Michael Jackson in his past life, and... Surprise, surprise, a year later, Michael Jackson had come up with a whole new album. Although that's different, because I believe that Martin is Michael in his past life. So if Martin had anything to do with the release of that album, well, it's his life, it's his past. It hasn't really got anything to do with me. Also, Michael Jackson was a big megastar who died fairly recently. So he has a massive fan base, so to release songs of his, you know, it's not that bad. And if Martin doesn't believe that he's Michael, well then he's basically got nothing to worry about. Like, I am upset because I believe that I'm Aaliyah, I believe these people know, and therefore anything they do that involves Aaliyah, I believe they're only doing it because of things that I've said. And then for them to ignore me, you know, that's just really bad. It's one thing to ignore me because they believe they're fulfilling an ancient covenant, an ancient prophecy. It's another thing to ignore me and then do lots of things about me behind my back, making money out of things that I did in my past life whilst they continue to ignore me. But many agreed that the album should be scrapped when Aliyah's immediate family, Rashad, Michael, and Diane, announced that they would not be a part of the project, and the project did not have their blessing. Plus, Aaliyah died in 2001. That's a long time ago. Usually when people die, okay, they are remembered, but they're not remembered to the extent that people would actually re-release music, especially if they've only had three albums. You know, if Madonna or Britney died, I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of unreleased material released. Maybe even 10 years after their death, this will happen. Although it will beg the question, why was it not released, you know, one or two years after, maybe three or four years after? Why do you have to wait 14 years after her death? That doesn't make sense. I say 14 because I believe it was in 2014 that this song was potentially going to be released. But then I believe they changed the dates on the postings to make it look like it was going to be done the year before I found out that I was her. But I don't think that was the case. From the knowledge that I gave them, I believe that they have gone to Aaliyah's uncle and told him that they believe they know who Christ is. They believe this Christ figure and this Christ figure is now saying that she's Aaliyah, reincarnated. You know, like the story of Jesus, someone dies and then rises again on the third day. You know, I believe that they've told the uncle this and then the uncle thought, that's a good idea, let's give these vocals to Drake to come up with a new album. Unfortunately, Aaliyah's uncle Barry Hankerson was the mastermind behind the project. Reports began to surface that Missy Elliott and Tim Willen would not be involved in the project either, which sparked immediate backlash towards the project. But officially, you have nothing to do with this project, not involved, don't, don't. As far as me, mm -hmm. I don't. And that's just out the respect of the family. her family. Um, but if they came and they said, we're ready for an Aaliyah album, I know I'm front and center. I know that Tim is front and center. But I don't want to speak for him. No, I would do it. I mean, I would. I mean, but it got to be, you know, like, we, it's a deep situation, you know, like with us. Like, if, no, if the, like, like, if, 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 if the mama and all them, you know, everybody, like, you know, because that's a, that's a death. You know what I'm saying? Everybody yeah. has to come 
together and look at us face in eye to eye and be like, this was what we this is what we want. You know, I wouldn't have minded and I don't mind if that's what would have happened. But to release 12 new songs, knowing that Aaliyah's not dead and that she's alive, only you're not allowed to talk to her for five, six years. Now, that's where I do mind. To release this album knowing you're only going to ignore me for a year or two, whatever, I would have recovered. But to do it knowing you're going to ignore me for six, seven years, that's wrong. So I'm really glad that this album didn't go ahead. I would have had massive issues if this album would have come out. Because, you know, surely I'm Aaliyah. If anyone should be releasing these new tracks, it should be me, not Drake. Okay, yes, the uncle does have the rights because they're probably his songs. He was the one that owned the Blackground company. But yeah, I'm really glad this album did not come out because I would be pretty upset to have to listen to a whole new album that Aaliyah's come out with just after I say that I am Aaliyah. And then for them to just ignore me for five, six years however long it will be, you know, that would have been an awful thing for me. Because my dream is to release an album and to become famous. Plus, I'm pretty sure that if this album is released after Aaliyah is exposed as being Christ, it will likely gain far more attention, far more record sales, and you'll make far more money out of it. So yeah, doing it before, okay, you'll get some sales, but doing it with my help, you know, you'll make 10 times as much, maybe even 100 times as much, maybe even a 1000 times as much, actually, if everyone in the world starts believing that yes, me, and her are the Christ that died and rose again. After August came to a somber close, the project was talked about no more, with Noah Forty stating that he walked away from the project quickly after hearing that Diane did not approve months later. I know Aaliyah doesn't even have the rights to the songs. It is the uncle's company who owns them. Or maybe they've been bought off by another company and I don't know the situation behind it. Unfortunately, Aaliyah's music has been out of print since 2005. Barry Hankerson has refused to allow Diana Rashad to own the masters to Aliyah's music. The legal battle surrounding Aliyah's music has prevented her music from being available on digital outlets. However, that has not stopped distribution companies from attempting to gain a quick buck from her music. In early 2017, a collection of Aliyah's hits released in the UK in 2005 mysteriously appeared on iTunes days before her birthday. The album reached number two on the main iTunes charts, placing above many of today's acts. But just after the album had peaked, it was quickly taken down by Reservoir Media, the current owners of Aliyah's catalog. If there is a bunch of people that know that I'm Christ, it is a big possibility that these people have actually bought the rights to Aaliyah's songs. Because they know that one day when I'm exposed as being the Christ, they're going to be able to make a huge amount of money off them because people are going to want to hear Aaliyah's songs as much as they can. Hence, a lot of people are going to want to put her music inside films or adverts or on TV. Hence, a lot of money can be made from this. I'm not mad at Barry Hankerson for thinking it's a good idea to release the album, though because I do understand that he's in his late 70s. Five years is a long time. I'm hoping nothing happens to him, but at the same time, tomorrow is not guaranteed to everyone, especially if you're in your late 70s. And in fact, if there is a bunch of Sony executives, or Disney, or whoever knows, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if these big money-making companies who know that Aaliyah's not dead have bought up these songs because they know that she's the Christ and they know that one day they're going to be able to make a lot of money from owning the rights of them. So I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't told the parents if they're keeping it to themselves so that they can plan this big event where they can make lots of money out of it, you know. But in a way, I'm not really bothered because I understand that people do things for money. If the only way people are going to help expose me as being the true Christ is because they believe they can gain some money out of it, you know, if that's their goal, if that's their motivation, then... Okay, fine, I'll use that. I have far better intentions than that. But so long as it's me who's being called the Christ, as long as the people listen to me and not the people who own my music or the people who are making money out of it, you know, this is where Christianity fails. Jesus was promoted because a bunch of people wanted to make money off of Jesus. The problem is with Jesus is Jesus couldn't talk. Jesus couldn't be a good example because he was never a real person. He never wrote any books. He never gave any real guidance. And his example is pretty shit because all he really did was take demons out of people and suppose heal people. You know, there's nothing about his character, there's nothing about what he believes other than the fact that he thinks that divorce is bad and that everyone in the world is a sinner. You know, I don't think he cured anyone in the past, but even if he did cure people in the past, it doesn't help anyone in today's society because he's not here to do these kind of miracles or to prove his power. These things aren't helping the world, whereas my opinions can help the world. So as long as you promote me as Christ, I don't care what your motivation is. If it be money, then so be it. Jesus was wrong about most things. It is possible to serve both money and God. Jesus doesn't say much, but what he does say is completely wrong and backwards. He's like a test. Someone who's come to make prophecies about a future Christ 
only he himself is not a real Christ. Anyone who reads the Bible, believes that everything he says is correct, is just dumb. And they're the ones who have been led astray. But I know what to say to make a difference in the world. I know that people's need and people's greed for money can in a way make them a bit useful. So I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't told the family that she's dead. Hence making it easier for them to buy the rights of these songs. You know, I don't trust anyone in this world. Because I know people put money over doing what's right. Especially if it's a company that's largely out to make money. And they'd buy the rights because they know that one day I'm going to want to use these songs. But for me to do that, I have to go through them. Hence, they'd be able to use these songs as a way of controlling me. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they've come up with this scheme already. Hence, they'll be the ones that make the money out of this. You know, I wouldn't even be surprised if that's happened. But if they've got any respect for God, they wouldn't have done that. That's one of the reasons why I want to be exposed on Big Brother, because at least I'll have more control over what I say. Although I know there'll be a difference between what I say and what actually gets aired. But I have more trust towards Big Brother too, because it really would be in their interest to promote me as being the true Christ and good person. Unless, of course, if I'm wrong and maybe I am just delusional. Maybe all the insults that people have given me are insults that are just true. You know, I guess I won't know until I go on. But I believe that they will know because I'm pretty sure that John Endemol knows Martin Dodd so they'll be able to find out if he's doing things about me behind my back and they won't need to tell me until it's revealed to the public. So yes, everything that gets exposed to the public will be very controlled. But at the same time, if I'm Christ, they would love the idea of having this control. And they'll get far more viewers if there are a bunch of people that are capable of believing that I'm Christ. And if they believe, well, I'm their mother, they're not going to want to insult their own mother. But then again, they don't have any respect for God. No one does, so I don't really know how it's going to play out. And maybe I'm wrong about the dates. You know, maybe they generally were going to release this in 2012. You know, I don't know what people are doing about me behind my back. Since the project was scrapped and the backlash grew, Drake has refrained from publicly praising Aaliyah to this day. 